Um, well, I'd like to extend my thanks to the International Bipolar Foundation for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. And a huge thank you to everybody for tuning in wherever you are in the world. It's a real pleasure to be with you. So, yeah, today I'd really like to talk about my work and my experience with bipolar and how the disorder has played a formative role in my career. So what I want to do is I want to look at some of the paintings and sculpture to come out of the Akiyud studio, which I share with Kim Rask, and explore how they have been influenced by my struggle with the condition. And in the second half of the webinar, I'll be talking a little bit about 2365, the 18-month-long project in which I've been heavily involved and which will be shortly, as Debbie said, coming to fruition in Seattle next month. So here's my first slide. So what do we know about the relationship between artists and bipolar disorder? Well, it's a commonly held belief that there are close links between bipolar disorder or more generally mood disorder and the creative voice, whether that be expressed through the visual arts, the dramatic arts, music or literature. Indeed, over the last 20 years, there's been a sizable amount of academic research on the subject. Kay Redfield Jameson's 1993 book, Touch with Fire, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, really brought the subject into the public eye, and the debate has really endured since then. And, and even just a few days ago, and I'm sure some of you saw this, um, it emerged that Oregon State University and the University of California, San Francisco, have been conducting further studies into this area. So regardless of the nuances of individual programs of research, there does seem to be an overriding consensus that in general terms, certain symptoms associated with bipolar disorder, hypomania or mania, depersonalization perhaps, and heightened emotion, whether positive or negative, can have a profound effect on the artistic imagination and creative output. So it does seem that the uh, rather romantic or maybe cliched sentimental notion that one must suffer for one's art is actually accurate. Indeed, if you just type the words bipolar and artist into any internet search engine, the likes of Jackson Pollock, even Michelangelo, and these two fine fellows, Van Gogh on the left and Edvard Munch on the right, pop up time and time again. Now, I would add the caveat that a lot of these links are suggested rather than substantiated um, because these guys were, a lot of them were working and living before bipolar really came into the uh, public consciousness, if you like. Um, but there does seem to be, nevertheless, a substantial link between those who work within the creative sphere, whatever guys that might take, and those who suffer from mental illness of this kind. So much as I hesitate to wholeheartedly agree with this, I don't believe that they are, they are entirely mutually dependent states. One can, for example, be a brilliant artist without having bipolar, and one can have bipolar without being a particularly creative person. And much as I am reticent to mention myself in the same breath of these, as these great bastions of my field, I do believe this theory to be true if I examine my own personal circumstances. If you've come across the article I wrote recently for Natasha Tracy's website, you will know that I talked of my childhood and my teenage years. I was diagnosed, as Debbie said at the beginning of the webinar, with bipolar disorder type 2 at 19 when I was a student at Cambridge University in the UK. And given what I knew of the disease, it made perfect sense to me. I'd been a very creative, artistic child, and I dare bet many people would say I was rather precocious and temperamental and moody. But I knew that art would play a very important role in my adult professional life. So I absorbed the diagnosis. I told no one and just got on with my life. Depressive and manic episodes were largely suppressed. It was difficult, but they were. And I became the mistress, if you like, of concealment. I felt unable to tell my friends and family. And because of my professional situation, at that point I was reading for a PhD and I became a writer and professor of art history, I was worried that a public avowal of my condition would really compromise people's opinions of me and compromise my chances of being employed. So it was, it, was a, it was a decision I took at the time. And besides, I was living in a really competitive, slightly nice bourgeois society where admitting failure or weakness really just wasn't an option for me. So 
whereas the disorder was perfectly reconciled with my burgeoning career as an artist, it conflicted with the more public side of my professional and personal life, if you like. Well, things changed, however, when I started working with my artistic partner, Kim Rask, in 2011. Um, and the supportive nature of that collaboration and the desire to freely exchange ideas gave me the space and confidence to become more open about my condition. And I looked back over my old work and realized that a lot of what I had produced during my 20s was innately reflective of my condition. And here you see a slide of some of the earlier work I was doing. It was as though the act of public concealment had forced me to find another channel through which to express my psychological trauma. It was a type of, um, I suppose you'd say, visual sublimation, if you like. When I analyzed these early drawings, I realized that privately, at least, my art and my condition were always intertwined. And you can see in these two pictures, we've got a two, two examples of older preliminary sketches. And you'll see soon that they really do have a big influence, both in terms of style and subject matter, on the stuff that was to come out of our studio over the last few years. So over these last few years, Kim and I have attempted to readdress and refashion some of the ideas and forms of my earlier work. Psychological or, if you like, psychoanalytical introspection has become a central theme. And more specifically, <coughs> excuse me, we focused on the ways in which the physical body can both harbor or reflect psychological pain or trauma. In other words, we explore the relationship between the internal psychological and the external physical landscapes of the self. So I'm just going to show you a piece of sculpture that we, we've been working on. So this piece of sculpture really illustrates this idea, I think. So as you can see, it's called Suspension State of Being, and it was created and exhibited last year in Brussels, Belgium. That's where we were kind of partly based last year. So here we see a human form, a child, whose right side is pristine and beautifully modelled, yet whose left side is completely blown apart. And you can kind of see that on the left-hand side of the slide. Now, just to give you some more details on the materials we use to make this piece, the main body is actually constructed in the traditional method from plaster, and we then use shards of resin and fiberglass to create the delicately, delicately faceted explosive mass on the left-hand side, and there you can see it in more detail, that beautiful and meshed um, texture there. So in this piece, we wanted to get across the idea of dualism, or of binary opposites, if you like, where what appears to be flawed on the outside can be fractured and broken on the inside, and that the ferocious power of one's true self will always have the capacity to break out and make itself known, and to shock to some degree. So in this shot, as I just said, you can see the left-hand side in more detail where the explosion has left a gaping hole. And inside the void, we see a golden egg-shaped form suspended within her torso. I hope you can see that there. It's quite dark. Which one, perhaps, could argue uh, evokes that, that soul or that true self I was just talking about, that egg being the true soul or true self? Now, you'll also note, if I go back, that the form is completely mute. Now, this sounds like a really obvious thing to say, given that she's an inanimate piece of sculpture. But in fact, that she, but the fact that she's screaming, but we cannot hear her, is really significant. In fact, this idea of suppressed distress, of somehow being shackled simultaneously by one's pain and the need to conceal one's condition, is a really important theme uh, which recurs in some of our other work. So if I show you this piece, if I flip forward, here we go. So this piece um, is called Labor Release 4, as you can see, and it was also produced last year. And again, we see another childlike form sleeping. She appears calm, yet she cannot move, bound by that red rope that's really just around her, wrapped around her, which again, we could say, is a symbol of the restraints of her condition and social expectation. And the same things come into play in the next slides, in the next piece of sculpture here. And now this is a much larger installation, again called Labour Release, this time two. You can see a spotted little trend in our uh, titling here. And so a similar idea is played out here. Once again, we see a childlike form trapped in this 
almost never-ending mute screen. And if I flip forward one more slide, you can see the full installation. Here we are. So you can see how the original form on the left has been disintegrated into three disparate parts here. So we have a torso in the background, we have a head in the foreground, and an arm on the right-hand right side. And all are held down by sections of red steel rebar. So the most, it's almost as though the most innocent of beings, the physical form which we all inhabit as babies, has been horrifically torn apart here. Now, it took us over, just, ironically, just over nine months to a very long days, both sides of both sides of the Atlantic, to make this complete installation from original form through to mold making, casting, and finishing, and we took it out to the desert in Nevada in two in the two thousand um, in two, in the summer of two thousand and twelve. As you can see, that's where it was photographed. Now, during its conception, production, and exhibition, it caused some controversy, as you can guess, and we had some very strong reactions to it. Some viewers found it inspiring and thought-provoking. They really engaged with it. But some really found it, well, I should say, just downright unpalatable and offensive. But for us, it was a really important piece of work, not only because of its technical uniqueness. For those of you who are interested, she, uh, the forms are actually made from polyurethane foam, which is like a builder's insulation foam, which was then heated to a high temperature, rendering the forms really cracked and withered and desiccated. And you can really see that in the foreground form here in this slide. So it wasn't only important for us because of a technical point, but because it was full of raw emotion. It spoke of my early diagnosis and all of those years in the wilderness when I was really in, felt incapacitated like a young child, unable to tell anyone of my condition. And the fact that this installation aroused such strong emotions in the viewer was a really good thing for us. I mean, our job as artists is to interpret our own personal experiences and create objects which challenge, make people engage, think and question themselves and their place in society. So, although these pieces, those, these, these pieces of sculptures I've just shown you, um, relate to my bipolar diagnosis and struggle to suppress the condition, their symbolism actually was quite veiled. We never revealed the true meaning of each sculpture and let people interpret them as they chose. And today is actually the first time I've actually really explained these in detail. Um, but at the end of 2012, Kim and I talked about finally taking on bipolar, the shape of it, the daily experience of it, as a fully avowed subject in its own right. Now, although I was already used to articulating how I felt day to day through my artwork, what, so for example, when I saw my psychiatrist, I would often express my feelings through drawings and diagrams rather than words, um, this was still a big step for me because I knew it would mean, would mean coming out about the disorder for the first time. But on January the 1st, 2013, and here I am in the studio, a long 17 years after diagnosis, I started the 2365 project. So each day for the entirety of the year of 2013, I painted a six by eight canvas. And you can see me engaged in the activity right there. Um, completed where I, wherever I happen to be in the world, each painting really had the aim of reflecting my emotional and psychological state. So mania, depression, stability, over that 24 hour period. I also um, wrote a diary of sorts and um, short entries to accompany each image. So the goal was not only to give people a glimpse into my life as an artist, but also to provide a candid visual record of the personal day-to-day -day journey of someone living with bipolar disorder. So the goal was not only to give people a glimpse, uh, yeah, so it, yeah, really a glimpse into my life and how I was struggling. I must also add that I refrained from taking medication during this time to give a pure view as possible of the disorder as I could. So as I started working through good days, bad days, manic days, depressed days, stable days, and frankly, in quotes, normal, boring days, um, I realized that certain forms, styles, and colors were beginning to establish themselves as meaningful, and pa visual patterns slowly started to emerge. I was beginning to create an artistic vocabulary, if you like, to describe my own brand of bipolar. 
So, of course, the best way to show you this is to show you some of the images from um, the series. And this is the first time, really, that we've really gone very public with some of the images. So this, you, you're very lucky today to be seeing them. Okay, so here we have day 169. So we're pretty far into the project at this point. And looking at this image, we can kind of tell it's a pretty positive image. Um, and we can tell this from the predominance of gold and violet, which for me, established themselves early on as, as colours which were re could reflect a happy and contented mood. The way in which this canvas is painted, is painted is very loose and exuberant. You can clearly see the brush strokes, which also indicates a carefree and confident attitude. And interestingly, if I take my cursor, um, you can see an almost bird-like abstract form in the centre of the composition there. And that's really significant because it, the bird came to personify me, or the self, if you like, in a lot of subsequent paintings. So here it is soaring through this beautifully coloured, vivid, abstract sky. So if we go on to the next slide, here we are. This is number 242, so again, a bit further through the year. And you can see that this is so different in terms of palette, style and atmosphere. And here I am, right in the middle of a manic phase. And I think you can tell this in the, you know, in the chaotic mess and febrile streaks of colour tearing through that composition. It's very ha heavy-handed, there's really no restraint at all, and it's very thickly painted. It's almost as though I'm reveling in the paint, powerfully moving it around the canvas with this invincible confidence that you sometimes get with mania. But note, there's a huge wave of white dripping down the canvas, and this is so significant, as it forewarns of a severe crash. White is, for me, without doubt, the worst colour in terms of mood in my palette. It signifies a deep depression, which actually many people are quite shocked by, as they assume that black would be the colour of depression, but actually black is a kind of baseline colour for me. So we can see here that this terrible phase is thundering its way towards me, is about to swallow me up. And here we go, day 193. So we've gone back in time a little bit, but this is indeed a day of depression. And so we see that white coming into play again, but the white is different here. That band of white really across the center of the composition really does mesmerize the viewer and pulls you right into the center of the composition. And it's, and maybe you can't see it on the, on the screen here, but it really does have that effect when you see it up close in real life. But yet again, notice the difference in style between the previous canvas, this one, and this one here, 193. The light and colour here is much more diffused. It's soft. It's almost ethereal. And I really wanted to get across the idea of being suspended in a, a white noise, if you like, of floating in that dead numbness of depression, which some of you may have experienced, and being barely in touch with the physical self. And here's another example. I'm just going to show you 187, going back in time a little bit more. And this really is a, we're really stuck in a depressive phase here. Very, 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 very bad. And you can see that cloud of grayish white just enveloping the entire composition, swallowing up the viewer. Barely anything is discernible through this, this terrible isolating mist. But you can see, I think in the bottom right, there's a tiny little ball or sphere there. Yeah, which will become significant, you'll see soon. So, going back to 193, well, what's also interesting about this image, I think, is the use of bright blue. Now, bright, bright blue for me, uh, especially this kind of intense, technicolor, acerbic blue, is a shade associated with performance and facade. So, when you see blue in the series, you, you know that those are days when I am acting, I'm entertaining people with the public me and concealing how I'm truly feeling it inside. So you can see that day 193 was a real, a real day of contrast. What, how I felt inside really wasn't being shown in my public face. So let's go back to this one. So the three examples I've just shown you, well, four examples actually, um, are actually very abstract in style, I think you'll agree. We can't really identify... Um, objects or for forms very easily. Um, but not every day was like this. For example, this one, day 291. So we're more figurative in style here. So everything's more le easily legible. And we can see 
a still life. You know, it might, it's rather sad and dirty looking, and, but we still see apples and fruit and bottles and books. So we can see that because things are easily discernible and legible, then perhaps it was, this was more of a, a stable day. It was a normal day. You know, I was engaging with things around me and I was feeling okay. And let's go on to the final image I'm going to show you here. This is day 365. Now, some of you have probably already seen this if you've been aware of the project so far. So, again, a little bit abstract, but you can still understand what's going on. Um, so, the last painting of the year, this was completed on New Year's Eve. And if we pick apart the composition, we can clearly see a brightly colored urban landscape um, with in the background with a sinewy golden tree which is dominating the foreground rising up and really really a strong force in the picture now what and you can see that one of the trees tentacle like branches is reaching out into that vivid blue sky note the use of blue again and is cradling what appears to be a golden sphere or sun now there's a huge amount of symbolism in this picture it's all incredibly significant much like the bird the sphere or ball is often used to personify the true self. So you remember in the white picture, we saw the little ghost of a white ball in the corner. And you remember even in the sculpture, the first piece of sculpture I uh, showed you, you saw the golden ball in the center. So again, a personification of the true self, perhaps. Okay, and similarly, the tree is a recurrent motif throughout the project. If you were to see all the images, you would see a tree popping up all the time. Now, a tree, is, is quite a fluid symbol, actually, though. It's not a fixed symbol. Um, here's another example here. So this, we're going back to 115, and you can see there are tree-like forms coming up the side of the composition. So sometimes trees are supportive and comforting, and at other times they're quite demonic and anthropomorphic, taking on human tendencies, which are really quite horrific and petrifying. And I think this day 115 really showed you that in, in practice. Now, going back to 365, I'll leave you to decide whether the tree is menacing or, or friendly in this one, I, and I won't give you any clues on that one. So, well, this image is really important for us because we put it up on social media at the end of the day on December the 31st, and we had a really great response to it. People were engaging with the image, they were trying to decode it, they were asking us what certain elements symbolized, we were, they were coming up with their own ideas, as they had done actually with other image we'd, we'd, images we'd sneakily released through the year. And this type of interaction really for me illustrates the transformative power of the 2365 project as a whole. So unlike written descriptions of bipolar, which can sometimes be a little unambiguous, um, every feeling here in the project is expressed through color and form. That means that absolutely anyone can engage with the images and interpret them in completely different ways. Obviously, they mean particularly particular things to me, as, as I've described today, but each painting is infinitely relatable, whether you have a direct relationship with bipolar, an indirect relationship with bipolar, or you're just simply someone who's interested in art. So it's a project that gets people thinking and talking. Well, what did I learn from the project? Well, it highlighted that being bipolar for me is both a blessing and a curse. I'm relatively lucky as once over, I can use the white periods of despair as inspiration for my work, as you've seen here. And I can exploit that creative energy, that intellectual clarity, and that, that supreme implacable confidence you get during buzzing manic days to propel myself through tasks in the studio and through life. Um, for someone who's quite pessimistic <laughs> normally, that's actually quite refreshing for me to have that kind of confidence. Um, and similarly, I try and see depersonalization as a virtue. That's something I suffer from, as I'm sure some of, some of you do too. Um, but I like to think of it as being much like a cubist painter, you know, by floating high above the real world, I can, I can see the world from different planes and angles, which obviously helps me in my creative endeavor. So although the bipolar highs and lows can interfere with my daily routine in the studio, um, I'm very lucky by the way, because I do have a fantastically supportive colleague and I do have a fantastically supportive husband. So I'm very, very lucky in that respect. I do try on the whole though, to regard bipolar as a positive force in my career and also my life too.
So many people have asked me whether engaging in the project was in any way therapeutic. Well, I have to admit that it completely failed um, to make me feel any better or cure me in the conventional sense of the term. In fact, trying to look inside and localize that essential raw emotion and interpret a particular psychological state was very, very difficult. It was a struggle, and the process of analysis sometimes exacerbated the depression or mania that I was experiencing at the time. But it did underline that creative endeavor, and I'm sure you know, if, you, if you're interested in art therapy that this is absolutely true, it did underline that creative endeavor can be therapeutic in dealing with, or at least helping us understand, the idiosyncrasies of bipolar disorder. As I mentioned earlier, I can now recognize the patterns and rhythms of my own particular brand of the disorder. And I also realize that living with the condition is extremely exhausting. And that's only something that came to me after I finished the project. You don't always appreciate it because you're constantly living in the eye of the bipolar storm. And you don't always have the luxury of stepping back and viewing your particular experience from a distance. But this really has enabled me to do that. So... Finally, 18 months after conception, the 2365 art book, featuring all 655 65 images, is now being published. So the book is essentially a visual record of this year-long journey. So it has all the paintings in there, and it also has the written daily diary that I kept during the time. So as Debbie said at the beginning of the webinar, the launch of the book is on May the 8th um, in Seattle which we're hosting alongside the foundation. So if you're in Seattle then, please do come along. And all paintings will be on show there, um, absolutely every single one, as well as some of the sculpture you've seen today. So um, do get in touch, and if you know anybody who would like to come along, it would be lovely to see you and see them. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to listen to me today. I hope it's been interesting for you. It's been a real pleasure sharing my story and I really hope you've enjoyed it. So thank you so much for coming on that journey with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Missy. That was absolutely wonderful. And we greatly appreciate you sharing your artwork with all of us. Um, before we take any questions, um, well, let me just explain. There is a question box on your control panel where you can type in your questions and Missy will answer them. Um, but we just wanted to share that um, any information, and we do this with all of our web webinars, that um, the content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Uh, we recommend that you always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. So thank you again, Missy. Um, no the first question is, um, did stop taking, when you stopped taking meds, um, did that seem too risky? Were there withdrawals, risks of reactions to stopping? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Actually, I, I would say that I'm not someone who likes taking medication and uh, I know there are a lot of us around who don't like taking it. Um, it and, and I think I can often control my symptoms or live with them without medication. So it wasn't a huge deal for me. I, I'm very lucky in that respect. I know a lot of people are very dependent on medication to, to, to merely just, you know, function normally or what, what we perceive as normally. Um, but, no, taking, refraining from taking medication really wasn't a huge issue for me. Um, it was, but for me it was important because I really wanted to just show, show the condition warts and all without feeling as though my moods were being flattened in any way, shape or form. But that's a really great question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. How long have you been involved in art? Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, well, I mean, really, Every, you know, since I was a child, it, it was something that was always going to be part of my life. And I knew that I always wanted to be an artist, even when I was little. Um, uh, and really, I studied art at school until I was 18. And then it became more of a sideline. I mean, I was, I was studying a lot and then I was teaching. But really, it's been there in my life constantly. And it's, it's you know, if you ask anybody who knows me, it was pretty obvious early on that this was going to be the job that I would do. And... Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's a constant force in my life, and now it really is. Over the last few years, it's really kind of just taken over my whole life now. So 
I really, yeah, so, so it's been there all the time, absolutely. Thank you. Um, our next question is, I'm confused about the white representing deep depression. Shouldn't it be black? Um, you know, as I said in the, in the lecture, it's really, you know, a lot of people have said that, and that it's so surprising to a lot of people. Absolutely everybody has said, when I sort of say, well, white is kind of a depressive color, and they're, and they're like, well, what? That doesn't make any sense. And actually, black for me is a kind of neutral color. If you were to draw out a, you know, color out a spectrum um, of my bipolar palette, you know, black would be right in the middle, neither acidic nor alkali. It'd be neutral, slap bang in the middle. It's, I know that sounds counterintuitive to a lot of people. And, and I know look, this is only my interpretation of it. A lot of people would see black as the, the true color of depression. And that's absolutely fine. But for me, white is, I think it evokes it more. It, it, it gives us a, it's this impression of suspension, being suspended in, the, in a cloud where you can't really contact or engage anybody else and you're completely cut off from the world. And that's the kind of um, idea I was trying to get across by using white. And it's always been the color of depression for me and not black so but it's a really good question and I'm really glad you know you picked up on that because it, 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 so many people have said it <laughs> and um yeah but that's yeah white for me is the one not black I'm afraid thank you why do you think so many people with bipolar disorder seem to be creative well I do you know what? I don't know <laughs> um that's that's a question for the scientists I think um I think it is because of those those symptoms, you know, if you try and look at the symptoms that we have um, in a positive way, so for example, I was talking about depersonalization. Now, that can be a pretty scary experience for anybody who's had it. You know, this idea of being detached from your body and viewing your body from a completely different viewpoint is a petrifying thing. But actually, when you, you analyze it, when you're in your more stable moments, you think, do you know what? That's absolutely incredible. And I think creative people tend to try and look at things from outside of the box. I hate using that kind of cliche, but you understand what I mean. You, we, we try and look at things from a different perspective. So I think there's something like depersonalization really does help. Um, the idea of feeling something so intensely that it consumes your whole body. So with depression, you know, you get that sense. And, and mania as well, when your whole body is buzzing. The fact that you can experience emotion, heightened emotion, to the highest degree or the lowest degree is, is something that no doubt helps creativity because, you know, that, that's what creative people do. They try and tap into those really strong emotions to create something which really has a universal message. So, I, really, I, I mean, really we'd have to talk to the scientists about that, but that's my take on it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Congratulations, Missy, for this amazing journey um, into your desperation to creation. The question you. is, you said you can identify the rhythm of your bipolar disorder. Can you plan your mm -hmm. creation accordingly? Did I plan my what? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Your creation, your artwork. Did I plan it accordingly? Um, I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, did I plan the... I mean, I, I didn't really plan it. I mean, I just started on day one and went through to three, uh, number 365. I, I didn't really plan anything as such. I really had to just switch off my brain and just go with it. It was almost like um, letting myself go down this river, you know, just being swept along by the tide. And now there was a risk, you know. There was a risk that I would have no mood swings that whole year, that I would experience no depression, that I would experience no mania, that, you know, we could have easily had 365 canvases of absolutely nothing, and it would have been rather boring, but, you know, so in that essence, we couldn't plan, we just had to go with it, and um, in terms of every day, um, really, again, you couldn't plan anything, if, if an emotion hit me, then I had to do it straight away, I had to pay it straight away, so really, I was at the mercy of my emotion, which wasn't particularly pleasant sometimes, but um, so really planning was kind of a subsidiary issue, really. No, exactly. So. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned art therapy. Do you do that in mm -hmm. conjunction with your own artwork by seeking a professional? No, I don't actually. And um, it's something that 
I'm really interested in actually. Uh, but no, I don't. And but I know a lot of people do get immense help from that kind of thing. And I think it's a fantastic initiative. And if people can use R or any kind of creative output to really kind of tap into their disorder and understand their disorder better, then I think that's a fantastic thing. And you know, but it's not something I do. But I really do think it's a brilliant, brilliant um, initiative. Really do. Thank you. What are your plans for your next project? Uh, okay, so um, we have um, uh, maybe three, I suppose three big projects um, next after a holiday because it's, we've been working for several years without a break. Um, we, we're, we have one big sculpture project which is actually called Hidden Among Us, which is again looking at bipolar. It's probably going to be one of the last things we do about bipolar disorder actually. And it's comprising 200 sculptures so a cast of 200 and they're all the same and we're playing on the statistics of bipolar disorder i think the latest research says it's 2.5 percent of people worldwide have received a diagnosis so out of those 200 one will be painted in gold and you know they will all be white apart from this one gold one and it will be they will be spread out in this beautiful installation space and it's going to be a fantastic exhibition uh, installation very dynamic, very, um, very ambitious, but very engaging. So again, using bipolar as, a, as an impetus, really, in that installation. We have a couple of other things going on as well, but um, that's probably the main one which, uh, which we can uh, reveal at the moment. Thank you. And uh, the next question is, where can they find the article you did the interview with that you had mentioned early on? Okay, so if you go to, um, if you look up uh, Natasha Tracy's website, she's a big bipolar activist, and um, I wrote an article for her. So if you go to her website, Natasha Tracy, um, you will find the article there. So that was out about, um, I think, probably about a month ago, two months ago. So you will see it there. Thank you. I've suppressed the creative side of me for years. How do I go about releasing that part of me again? Wow, um, that's a good question. Um, do you know what? You don't need anything fancy. You know, I teach art, and really, you need you really only need a piece of paper and a pencil. You don't need anything else. As I said, you know, when I used to go and see my psychiatrist, I used to draw things out for her. I used to sort of say, "Well, I feel like this," and there's a line here, and there's a circle here, and I would use diagrams and really just explain my state of mind through through that means well I would say that you can do it anywhere you know artistically so with a piece of paper and a pencil musically you could do it um, drama literature writing write a diary this all these things can help you really understand your own personal um, brand of the disorder if you like so or maybe speak to an art therapy group, that kind of thing, you know, don't ever feel scared of going down a creative path because absolutely everybody has the ability to do something, so don't ever worry about that. Thank you. The next question is, who are your favorite artists that have inspired your own artwork? Oh, wow. Um, gosh, we get asked this a lot, actually. Um, I think in terms of our sculpture, I think, obviously, uh, some people might see some similarities with the work of Anthony Gormley. He's a very famous British sculptor. Um, in terms of my painting, well, I don't know. I think because I've, I've, I've studied art history and I've taught art history for so many years, I've always been kind of immersed in other artists' work, and I've kind of picked up bits and bobs. It's natural for any artist to be like that, and you, you're subliminally influenced by everybody you see. But personally, oh, who do I love? I will, you know, all of the really good uh, modern painters, I mean, I, I think probably Gerhard Richter is one of my most favorite ones, but my work isn't hyper-realist like his, so um, I don't doubt you'd see an influence. But, you know, really, I can't really answer that question. In terms of sculpture, Anthony Gormley, probably Ron work as well, but in terms of the painting, well, um, it would be very difficult to say. Thank you. The next question is, sorry, it's just loading right now. No, it's okay. 
Could you please tell us a little bit more on what will be taking place at the event in Seattle? Okay, so um, at the event on May the 8th, we'll, the, the art book will be launched officially. So it's the official launch of the art book, um, which means that, uh, I'll go back to it, there you go. Um, really, um, yeah, it's the official launch. So this will be when the book is unveiled for the first time and people will be able to see it. And also it will be on sale um, after that, that point as well, uh, to give you a bit of a shameless plug there. It will be on sale there and it will be on sale on our website. The address is at the bottom of the screen there. And also all 365 paintings will be on display. So this is a really rare opportunity actually because you'll see all of them in one place um, and we're organizing this with the International Bipolar Foundation, this event. So it's going to be a fantastic opportunity. And I think, you know, we're going to have lots of different groups there, mental health groups, other artists will probably be there. So it's going to be a fantastic event. We're probably going to have some media there as well, so it's going to be great. And if you'd like to come and see the paintings themselves, they will be on ex exhibition on the uh, Friday as well, so Friday, May the 9th, the, the details are there on the screen if you can see that there. So so the launch on May the 8th with the exhibition as well and the uh, just the exhibition on the Friday. Oh, and you will see some of our sculpture there. So some of the sculpture you've seen today, that will also be there as well on display. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. And that is, do you plan to exhibit this other than Seattle? Uh, we would love to, and um, yeah, uh, the, the the entire collection of 365 images will be will remain intact. We some are for sale, not the originals, but we do do I do do one-off copies for people because we've had a lot of inquiries with people wanting to buy things. We so the whole set of 365 Im images is staying together, and I I have no doubt that it will be going somewhere else for on show. I don't know where at the moment, but I, 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 I would dare bet you'll see it somewhere else very soon. So um, we'll keep you posted. Do keep in contact with us and we'll, we'll just let you know. So don't, don't worry, we'll be there somewhere. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. And we apologize if we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, um, but feel free to visit the ukiud.com website or you can visit ibpf.org. Thank you again, Missy. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.